Coming up today on Folks, we conclude our look at women behind prison bars. Sonia Massengill travels to Lafayette where she visited Janet Nurbass, a photographer with a very unique interest in snakes. And then we'll visit Jennings, Louisiana and take you to a festival welcoming home the Louisiana man, Doug Kershaw. I'm Rob Hinton. Those stories and more today on Folks. everyone and welcome to folks. What is life like at the Louisiana Correctional Institute for Women? Is it like what many of us see depicted in movies about women in prison? Well today we find out as we conclude our two-part look at women behind prison bars. Uh, there is absolutely no connection or no relation between the actual reality of the prison environment as it really is uh, when compared to the way it, it is in the movies so to speak. Uh, it's not, in the movies you usually find people always trying to break out and the meanest and the toughest, et cetera, et cetera, and very little attention are given to the other inmate, which constitute the greatest majority of the inmates. And those inmates are the ones that are, uh, that are most well-behaved, they're not violent, you know, and they just go along and during their time and they, you know, in the, in the best possible way that they can. And so the, the movie is geared toward, toward action and, and tapping the imagination, so to speak, but the reality of prison life is nothing like it's reflected in the movies. How would you describe your life here? Uh, uh, easy going. I, uh, um, work in office occupation back there where well, I do type. I'm in school all during the day and then in the evenings I might come here to the library. We have various activities we can do. And, uh, but there's times when I get lonely when, you know, when I wish I hadn't done the things I did. What it's like for me here, I can't speak for everyone. I could only tell you my side of it. It has uh, changed me into being a responsible person, very independent, um, very disciplined, and listen to what uh, the securities and the staff uh, tell me. I have learned a lot since I've been here. Have been bad and have been good. But I've learned a lot from being incarcerated. And I could look back on the way I used to be, and now it's totally two different people. Because like I said, I could um, give other kids advice. I can um, know that through my mistakes that I have made, um, I'm a better person through the mistakes that I have made. And I've learned from them. It's busy. Um, I have various job functions in my one job. And um, the job that I'm assigned to, it, it keeps me occupied. Um, so I don't, I don't have too many problems. Um, and it's like the old adage of idle minds or wasted minds. In the first few years, it was rough. But as time's going on, it's like I've more settled and I've accepted the fact and just make life how it's going to have to be for a while. 
when they drove me up here, this man was telling me about how bad it was going to be. And I was scared. I was really scared. And my palms were sweating. You know? I didn't want to face it. But it wasn't all that I thought it was going to be. I, I had the bad view of it. You know, I didn't. I was really scared. I wanted to be locked up or something so I didn't have to be around these other people. But uh, it was all opposite. They, they have something for you to do with your spare time. They have something to do all during the week, you know, your working areas. And it wasn't at all like I thought it would be. Although LCIW is a prison, in some ways the facility reminds one of life in a college dormitory. For example, the rooms, the cafeteria, and the grounds. Many of the inmates attend classes at the prison where they are taught a trade. We have four uh, Voltec programs. We have occupational sewing, we have uh, furniture upholstery and refinishing, and we have uh, uh, welding, and we have office occupation. And welding is one of the uh, um, one of the courses that I suppose you can define as non, a non-traditional female type, uh, type course. Do you feel that the staff here is helping towards your rehabilitation? Rehabilitation, I believe, comes from inside the individual. And, but the help that the institution gives in this is the rules that they set down that you have to follow. And it, causes you to realize that life is all about rules and you follow the rules and if you can survive with rules of your own then you should be able to s survive with rules of the society and in here we have rules and it has helped you know because you learn to grow and keep walking and following and learn respect for others as well as for yourself Rehabilitation is not within the institution. It was, it's within the person. You have to want to do what's right. Only person can do that is you, yourself. And do not, the people cannot give you that. You have to make up in your mind that you want to do what's right. That you tired doing wrong and you want to correct your mistakes. And you know, live a normal life just like anybody else without committing a crime. Rehabilitation to me, now I know what the, uh, the definition is, but rehabilitation to me means one thing. If you ask me uh, what it means, then you go ask an inmate what it means. She'll give you a, a different uh, definition. And probably if you ask someone on the streets what uh, rehabilitation means, he or she will give you a different uh, definition. And rehabilitation, you know, in my opinion, is, is sort of predicated, the notion is predicated, it's predicated on the notion that at one particular time a person was faring well, whatever that may mean, and all of a sudden uh, something happened in his or her life that just kind of snatched the rug from under them, they're at the bottom. So what we have to do is kind of help them get back where they were before. You know, my emphasis is is not on trying to get inside someone's head and say, look, here's what you need to do. I prefer to look at it this way. Create a change for environment. I think you should give an inmate an opportunity to better him or herself. If she or he choose to take advantage of it, so be it. If not, then that's the way it is. What do you see in your future? Well, I believe that someday I will be out of here and I'll be home and uh, I plan to be back into working in the world, in a business world and uh, no life of wildness ever again. I've realized the difference in the younger days and the days now. What do I see for my future? I can't predict the future, I know this. But I'm going to go back out into society. I'm not going to try to persuade anyone that I have changed because they're going to automatically see that change in me for the things that I, I'm going to do. I'm going back and uh, practice nursing, live with my parents. Hopefully, I might get married. 
but I'm not looking into that, the future that, you know, far. And uh, try to help my son as much as I can. And try to help other people in the community and uh, talk to young teenagers, trouble uh, kids, and give them advice. Time now for a question from the Folks Almanac. Our question this week has to do with a famous singer-actress who was the first black woman to sign a term contract in films. Her films include Panama Hattie and Cabin in the Sky. Her most popular recordings include Stormy Weather and The Lady is a Tramp. Who is she? We'll have the answer for you later in the show. Our next story takes us to Lafayette, Louisiana, where you'll meet a lady who until a year ago knew very little about snakes. She's photographer Janet Nirbass, and today her photographs of snakes are being featured in an exhibit entitled Louisiana Snakes Alive at the Museum of Natural History in Lafayette. Janet is also curator of the exhibit, which features live reptiles as a part of the display. Uh, it all began with Beverly Latimer, the director of the Lafayette Natural History Museum, inviting me to produce an exhibit in the museum. And it also um, came about because I was allowed to pick my subject. So my, one of my reasons for picking snakes was because I wanted a subject that I really didn't know very much about, that I could research myself, that was involved with the environment. And I wanted something that I could use my photography skills in in a way, perhaps, that nobody had approached the problem before. And I, I thought that as far as snakes were concerned, no one had ever photographed them purely for the visual aspects of the snakes. In other words, not necessarily trying to make them look as though they were in their natural habitat, but removing the snake from its natural habitat and just photographing it in a way that you could identify that snake if you ever saw it in the field, but also in a way that made you aware of the color and the pattern and made you also aware of what was unique about that particular snake. Janet lives in a house on the Vermilion River that she and her architect husband designed to celebrate the glory of South Louisiana Bayou Country. There, Janet cultivates a garden of wildflowers, the subject of her first exhibit of photographs at the museum. It is easy to assume that many of the subjects for the Snakes Alive exhibit came from her own backyard. Actually, um, the only one that I photographed in this exhibit that I found in my garden was a water moccasin. And uh, it was in a fenced-in vegetable garden, which is right on the edge of the river. The only water moccasin that I have ever found anywhere around my house uh, we have seen them occasionally in the swamp behind the house, but I had never had one in my garden before. Uh, but all of the other snakes that I photographed, a few were snakes that I found. Uh, one was a diamond backwater snake that I photographed that I found going over a ridge headed for the swamp. I caught this one and I photographed it and then I let it go again. Um, I photographed a green snake in the bushes, but mainly the snakes that I photographed were given to us by people in the area. We let people know that we were looking for many different species, and people called the museum, brought them in. The assistant curator of the museum, Steve Shively, went out and looked for a number of the snakes that we needed and you know, brought them to me to photograph. And then I got on the telephone. The ones that I couldn't find in the Lafayette area, I called all over the state. And uh, if someone told me that they had a buttermilk racer in Monroe, we either went and picked it up, or if they wouldn't give it to us, um, I would go there and photograph it. In addition to a complete set of zebrachrome prints, the exhibit has 10 live non-poisonous snakes in specially built plexiglass cases, as well as five of the six venomous varieties in glass cases. Janet has assembled an impressive amount of snake information as well. I planned for it to be this magnitude. I did not realize how difficult it would be to find all these snakes. Actually, finding the snakes was one of the major difficulties for me because I, I really did not think it would be that difficult. I thought that it was just a question of people bringing them in and maybe finding one or two that were missing, but there were some that just took, you know, I tracked down for weeks before I would find someone who had one. And there was a young man in the Biloxi area that went out and caught me one species that I had not been able to find. And uh, 
I, in other words, I had a little network of people that knew I was looking for certain snakes. Why snakes? I started the exhibit with the idea that I wanted to present the snake as a creature of importance in the environment and as a creature of living beauty, a creature that is worthy of our respect, our interest, and our study. And this was my attitude at the beginning, and this is still the way I feel about it. I still do feel that, um, I, I guess I am more comfortable with snakes now because I did reach the point when I started it, I had never picked up a snake in my life. And uh, getting them in and out of the glass box without touching them required all sorts of tricks. You know, putting a little box and having them crawl in and popping the top on, um, or you know, taking them directly from a container and letting them crawl into the box. Um, but by the time I reached the 46 photograph, 46 snake that I photographed, uh, I did actually pick one up, and it was quite pleasant to the touch, very smooth, very dry, not the way that you think of snakes as feeling. But I have to admit that I, it took me that long to get over whatever this built-in aversion is that people feel to touching snakes. There's more to this exhibit than snakes and photographs of snakes. The exhibit has snake drawings, snake paintings, ceramic snakes, a 30-foot long question and answer snake, snake carvings, and snake antiquities. This snake staff is uh, carved by David Allen of Homa. He carves many different types of staffs uh, and has done a number of snake images. Uh, I think that his statement about why he liked to carve a snake staff was because when snakes are out in the wild, he said you have no control over them. And especially when you're thinking of venomous snakes. But when you're carving a snake, then you have complete control. <laughs> this is a conch shell cup. It has incised a rattlesnake motif. Dr. Clarence Webb of Shreveport, who, ex, who is really responsible for quite a lot of the archaeological work that was done in the earlier part of the century, loaned me this shell. It's unique in that there are not very many of these conch shell cups that have been found all in one piece. And Dr. Webb excavated this one at the Belcher site, which is in North Louisiana. And it indicates that the early inhabitants revered the rattlesnake. And to them, the snake was in the nature of, uh, of a god. They were considered to be very powerful. And uh, they were respected and feared, but they were not hated. We're interested in stressing in this exhibit the relationship between snake and man from the time that man first appeared in Louisiana. And the early experience with snakes was usually one of reverence. It was not until the white man arrived and brought the Judeo-Christian ethic of um, the snake as the embodiment of evil that um, this attitude changed. And I think that um, you, when you look worldwide, you will find that every culture other than the Judeo-Christian reveres the snake. The snake is feared, but it's feared and respected. It's not feared and hated. Even in India, where snakes uh, kill people, just you know, any number of deaths a year in India from cobras, the snake is still revered. It is only in the Western civilization that we have this attitude of, of hatred for the snake. And it, it does go back to, you know, the Genesis story of the snake as, you know, unlocking all the evil of the world. For those of you interested in seeing the exhibit, it will be on display through November 24th at the Museum of Natural History in Lafayette. Time now for us to shift gears a little bit as we take you back in time through another folks flashback. This week's flashback takes us to the year 1983. Folks visited the National NAACP Convention in New Orleans. The organization heard from many contenders for the Democratic presidential nomination in 1984. Representing the GOP was Vice President George Bush. 
And there was entertainment, lots of it, like Stevie Wonder. On a song. And if you've listened to the words beneath the singing hummingbird, you'll hear them cry. The warning call in the sky I can see clouds I never thought would be filled with teardrops falling down. Our final story takes us to Jennings, Louisiana, where the townspeople turned out to welcome home a man who has helped put Jennings and Louisiana on the map. That man, of course, is Doug Kershaw, the Louisiana man himself, who did a lot of fiddling around for the Special Olympics. It was a celebration billed as the Doug Kershaw Festival, welcoming home the Louisiana man himself. The two-day celebration began with a parade on Highway 26 in Jennings, consisting of more than a dozen floats. The townspeople turned out in numbers to see the parade and the man who has helped put Jennings and Louisiana on the map. The festival was the brainchild of Tim West. Well, Doug's from Jennings, and he's known around the world, and I just felt it was time to honor the man. He put Jennings on the map, and uh, I just wanted to pat him on the back for it. It was a festive event. Plenty of crafts for sale, lots of beer, lots of music, a little dancing, and plenty of good food, too. The festival was more than a tribute to Kershaw. It was also a benefit for the Louisiana Special Olympics. Uh, Doug asked me at the beginning what I wanted to do with the money, and I said I hadn't gotten that far, and he said I'd like to give it to Special Olympics, and I said fine, so that's what we're doing with it, and it's a good cause. We will get all the proceeds after expenses, and in this case the, pro the expenses are minimal because a lot of the businesses here in Jennings and um, Welch have donated a lot of facilities and a lot of things that we are using. So how are the proceeds going to be used? They're going to provide for the sports, sports training and the programs for 22,000 mentally handicapped in Louisiana. Kershaw spent some of his time mingling with the people at the festival. He took a little time out to tell us what he thought of all the hoopla in his honor. I think this is just marvelous. You know, I've, uh, well, it's such an honor to be honored by your hometown. Hey, this is the first year we're starting off, you know, Next year, it's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. They wanted to do this. Uh, I asked what they were going to do with the proceeds, and they said, well, what would you like to do? I said, well, I've got a charity that I, that I really like, and it's uh, the Special Olympics, which I do indirectly, and of course, like, like now, directly. I do a lot for the Special Olympics. I like to do that. And so I'm well aware of what they do, and it's well worthwhile a cause. You have done a lot to put Jennings and Louisiana on the map. How does that make you feel? That makes me feel great. I, you know, I feel like an ambassador sometimes. But I, I believe in this, this state. I believe in the people. I believe in our music. I believe in our food. I believe in it, you know. Enough so I, I, I spent my whole life doing it. And it's paying off. It is paying off. By sundown on the second day of the festival, the people of Jennings and the surrounding vicinity turned out in numbers to hear the Louisiana man himself fiddle on his fiddle. And boy, what a show. Woo! Hang on, girl. Yeah. You guys ready? Oh, yeah. All right. Let's go.
the Doug Kershaw Festival truly a good time? Time now for the answer to our Folks Almanac question. This famous singer-actress was the first black woman to sign a term contract in films. Her films include Panama Hattie and Cabin in the Sky. Her most popular recordings include Stormy Weather and The Lady is a Tramp. Who is she? Well, the answer is Lena Horne, who in 1984 received the NAACP Spingarn Award. Well, that's our show for this week. Thanks for watching. We'll be back next week with a story on Buppies, black urban professionals, and we hope to see you then. Bye-bye. Ha, <laughs> ha,